I'm only ringing it up exactly as you ordered it. One of my jobs is in what is apparently one of the three sources of food, alongside Canes and Chick-fil-A, in a town of about 150,000 people. I don't know if we're just on a cosmic nexus of stupidity or what, but I would say maybe 50 to 70% of our customers suffer from some form of illiteracy. One of these is coupon illiteracy. So many customers don't know what those symbols on the coupon mean aside from the numbers, if they see them. So when they have a deal going on, sometimes the deal is actually better than the coupon offer. Thus, I end up charging someone more because I have to price override the item to use the coupon, which actually means it went up in price. It's what the customer wants. Other customers think they can beat us by ordering a cheaper item, then making a bunch of modifications to transform it into something else. I'd like a veggie sub, but can you please add ham to it? You don't just want to order ham? Have fun, that's an additional charge to you. Hi, I want a chicken sandwich, but can you replace the chicken with steak? Okay, so you want a steak sandwich. No, I want a chicken, but with a steak instead. Well, if you want to pay the substitution charge, what am I to go with? I mean, you don't work here, and you said this was how you want it made. P.S. Why is so much R&D spent making an easily comprehended menu when nobody ever sees it? The literate few look at the dinky little nutritional and allergen information and say we need a proper menu. Never mind the big bold menu that is literally right in front of their effing faces. What's up guys? Welcome back to Storytime with Uncle John back at the bridge again. Just released a video last night on Tales from Tech Support. Back today doing uh, malicious compliance. I know it's been goofy. We are... We are moving. We are in the midst of selling our current house and buying another house. Uh, I've never been great at timing, so this ought to be a fun little exercise because in order to actually get into the new house, our old house has to sell because one, you know, money comes from one and goes to the other. Um, so closing on our house happens first and then hopefully within two days because we're going to be homeless anytime that we're in that span between sales. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Sorry for any movement or shakiness that you might encounter here on the, uh, on the video, because honestly, I got to tell you this, this little building that I'm on is perched on the edge of this drawbridge structure. And anytime a big truck goes by, uh, sometimes even a small car, if they're going fast enough, makes this whole building shake. Some days I think I'm about to fall right in a damn river, but hopefully not anytime soon. Anyway, so stick around. I appreciate the fact that you've been patient so far because uh, the move has really thrown a lot of wrenches into things and I'm spending a lot of time sorting through old crap that we've had in that house for 20 years and, you know, either repacking it in things that in ways that make sense or getting rid of it or selling it or, or buying more crap so that we can actually move into the new house and things fit kind of the way we hope they'll fit. Lots of storage units and pods and things like that because uh, the less I have to move anytime in those two to three days between sales, if the closings happen the way they're supposed to, then, uh, you know, the better off I'll be. Anyway, let's do some more malicious compliance. Charge the truck battery at point B because it's cheaper. This ain't my story, but a friend's who's a truck driver. Recently, the contractor company said friend's boss works with got an electric truck. This is a big company. They already got a few of them, but a different location where charging is far easier due to many stations around. Because it seems to go well. Yeah, seems. Because next year the electric trucks won't be exempt from paying tolls. And mind you, an electric truck costs twice as much as a fuel option. Scania? Scania? I don't know. They thought it'd be a great idea and a good promo to get another e-truck at the location my friend works at. Only before ordering nobody checked on charging stations or even the distances and roads this guy drives. Only that his hometown is practical for their endeavor. Now comes the good part. Turns out we ain't got many stations that can charge a truck. I'm no electrician by any means, but I'd still consider myself technically apt. So I, yes, I went through the hassle to talk to this company, tried explaining that charging a battery is like filling a barrel, only that you attach the hose to the bottom. So you need a certain amount of X-based pressure to get that shit flowing because most charging stations only pack 75 to 150 kilowatts, and that's a no-go for a truck. The only 300 kilowatt station in the area is located in the next city. Not too far, but traffic sucks. Imagine driving an hour to make a 10 meter meter or 10 mile distance. I don't know, but management had other problems entirely. Turns out their problem was that the 300 kilowatt station charges don't know the exact value. Methinks like 80 cents per kilowatt hour. 
The 150 kilowatt station, however, costs only 65 cents per kilowatt hour, so they demanded he charge the truck where it's cheaper. And here it gets even better. This here is the reason why I tried reasoning with them to no avail, of course. Not every charging station is built to accommodate a truck, not even the ones that pack 300 kilowatts, which means my man here has to first find an empty space to leave his trailer. Once you're done with that, you still got to find an empty lot to park and charge. And once you're there, there's still the possibility of someone parking next to you and grabbing the second charging cable of the station, which then has the performance to 75 kilowatts. Just for reference, even charging at a 300 kilowatt station takes two hours. So after our arguments hit a brick wall, he gave in. You want me to waste valuable time on a piss poor charger just because it's a little cheaper? Fine. Next day, he proceeds to charging. After two or three hours, the office gets the jitters because work keeps piling up and they can't always manage to bring the freight in time. So they call him. Aren't you done charging yet? <laughs> nope, not even close, buddy. When the F are you planning on returning? We need you at work. You know, a truck only brings in money when it's rolling, not parking. He says, well, I ain't the one that came up with the idea to charge a effing truck at a 150 kilowatt station. You sent me here. I tried explaining it to you, but you wouldn't listen. And unless you want me to come over just to look for the next charging station, you'll have to wait. They say, how long? Well, I just hit the 17% mark, so I'm going to be here for a while. He was camped out there for the whole day. Didn't get squat done, and at the end of the battery still wasn't fully charged. They never bothered him again. I really don't know enough about electric vehicles to <laughs> make any kind of sensible argument for either side of this debate. Um, I think electric vehicles are going to be a good thing. I think, however, in the present time, people are jumping the gun a little bit with certain things. It's one thing to have electric scooters, cycles, and cars, maybe smaller trucks, you know, vans, um, whatever those, you know, the larger transit vans like uh, UPS and Amazon uses, that maybe, maybe those would be like my cap right now. Unless you're in a huge city, and you have the infrastructure at your depot where you where your trucks come from in the morning or at night or whatever, you know, their home base, unless the infrastructure is there to actually give full charges while they're off, you know, off the clock, then it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to start doing bigger and bigger and bigger trucks. I've seen people from other countries make the exact opposite argument that, you know, it's no big deal. Well, not every country is run the same way in infrastructure, government, even personalities, you know, the layman, we all, we all have such differing opinions on things <laughs> on where to put money for infrastructure and taxes and things like that, that I just, I don't know. It, it's going to be a train wreck for a while. What a lot of people don't realize, no matter where they're from, is that, yeah, we've got electricity pretty much everywhere now. That doesn't mean it's always accessible electricity. It doesn't mean that, you know, I can buy a fleet of, you know, a dozen or 20 electric over the road vehicles and expect to be able to charge them at my home base because sometimes the electric company either outright says, no, they can't pump you that much electricity pump. That's the wrong word, but you know what I mean? Supply that much electricity uh, to your location because they just don't have the means like the, the supply just isn't there or it's going to be so much more expensive because you're the only one, like imagine you move in some country property, you're way, you're miles from anything resembling civilization and you want electricity on your property from the grid. You're the only one out there. That means all those utility poles and all those wires and everything else. Guess who pays for all of that infrastructure? You do. And people, people just think the government's just going to throw it in. Well, you know, I'm not so sure they should, but if they did, somebody's still got to foot the bill. It's still going to come from somebody's pocket. <laughs> so nothing in this world is free. I don't know. There, there's, a, there's a couple problems here. The main one is some bean counter at this company decided it would be a good idea to start the, you know, electric truck thing at this small operation. And it can be a good thing, but you, you got to plan it out. It just doesn't sound like anybody put any real forethought into this. Not to mention the fact you can't keep making demands that, you know, your your people do everything that's just the cheapest because it's the cheapest and then think there's a, that there's going to be no repercussions, you know, in time or, you know, holdups in other freight jobs or whatever. So I don't know. It's just it's silly. It's just so ridiculous. I'm all for electric technology and things like that when it comes to vehicles. But, you know, things are going to have to majorly shift over the next 20, 30 years because 
right now, a lot of our electricity still comes from fossil fuels. So, you know, if you're doing it to clean the air, it looks great on the end, you know, going up and down the road, but you're still got a plant back there chugging out, you know, whatever kind of emissions because, you know, you're putting more demand on the plant. So, yeah, we're going to have to have a lot of infrastructure changes before things really get clicking with electric vehicles. I have to drive this truck. Okay. So back in the day, I was a truck driver. The company had a few trucks that were made for different jobs. Depending on the job you had to deliver, determine the truck you drove. So it wasn't too uncommon to drive three different trucks in one day. The company was piss poor on maintenance of the vehicles too. Over the years with them, I received a few fines for things like no inspection and stuff like that. Even though I received the fine, the company would pay the fine. No harm, no foul. Finally, our big truck really started to go downhill. It got to the point where it was barely running and needed a ton of repairs, costing thousands to fix. I told the company I refused to drive the truck as it was an accident waiting to happen. Well, this lasted a week and then they said that I needed to drive the truck for one delivery. Unfortunately, I agreed out of need to be a team player and service my customer. The drive was horrible. It was leaving a trail of smoke 10 foot high as I drove down the highway. I knew I was in trouble when they loaded a case of motor oil in the cab for me to fill the engine if needed. <laughs> oh dear. On the way there in the AM, cars behind me were turning on their high beams to see because of the smoke trail I was leaving. Then as the sun finally came up, people were pulling up next to me on the highway honking and giving me the finger. I found out so much liquid oil was coming out of the exhaust that oil was landing on the vehicles behind me. It was only a 50 mile round trip and the truck lost 24 quarts of oil and almost a tank of fuel. So I again told them I wouldn't drive the truck till it's fixed. As a truck driver, you're required to do a pre-trip inspection of the vehicle prior to driving every day. You mark down the defects and there's room for notes in the logbook. One copy stays in the truck and one copy goes to the company. There's a third copy that goes to DOT if requested. I made sure to fill this out fully every time I drove this truck. I also made a separate list, mostly as a note for myself covering things that I thought was important, but not necessarily a part of the pre-trip inspection. The next day I came in and found my truck fully loaded. I told them I wasn't driving the truck. They said, well, you have to. After a quick thought, I said, okay. Cue malicious compliance. I pulled out of the lot. At the traffic light, I'd make a left to head to the job. However, I was out of fuel, so I had to turn right to get to the gas station to fuel up. Then backtrack to head to the job. And yes, I meant gas. It was a 33,000 pound truck with a gas engine. Well, DOT was set up on the other side of the road just before the gas station. They watched as I drove by, wishing they could get me. In case you don't know, DOT stands for Department of Transportation. For big trucks, they run the way stations on the highway. But in heavy truck areas, they set up mobile stations and inspect trucks randomly. They verify paperwork is in order, and the vehicle and driver are safe. Any fines here are expensive. Plus, they can put a truck out of service, meaning it must be it cannot be driven until repaired. At that point, it must be towed and fixed. Then I pull on the fuel station. As I'm filling, I can feel them watching me. So I leave the fuel station and head back towards DOT. They run out into the street and make me pull in. They wanted this truck. I pull in and shut down the truck. The DOT cop walks up to the truck with a creeper. I say, why do you need that? He says, what? I say, the creeper. He says, I got to check your truck. I say, nah, I got a list. I hand him my notes and logbook. He says, hmm. Then he goes back to his car and I can see him furiously writing. After about 30 minutes, he comes back. He says to me, why are you driving this truck? I tell him that they told me I had to. There's no other truck, he asks? Nope. What happens if you don't drive this, he asks. I say, I guess I sit home. He says, I'll be right back. After about another 20 minutes, he comes back to me. He slaps a big red out of service tag on the windshield. Then he tells me there are 21 issues that are putting the truck out of service. Plus, I'm giving the company a fine for letting you drive this truck. Unfortunately, your fuel tax sticker is expired. If I write you up for this, it's a $10,000 fine to you. But I called in the local cops. It'll be a $90 fine for you that the company should pay. I thank him and he leaves. I call the company and get a ride back to the warehouse. Bottom line, they paid all the fines, which were north of $65,000, including towing. The next week, we had a fleet of new lease trucks with a maintenance plan with replacement trucks if ours were down for issues. And they came out and washed the trucks twice a month. I worked there another two years and quit because of other truck issues. A competitor poached me with better money, but this goes to show... I'm not risking my life and the public's life for your job. In the end, you paid for a $65,000 lesson. When I say I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it unless it's safe. Then I pull in the fuel station. As I'm fueling, I can feel them watching me. So I actually plucked that last part 
<laughs> out of the Reddit story. I'm not sure why that sentence was repeated at the end of the story. I am a little confused. I'm also working a weird 16 hour shift sitting in a little concrete box along the river's edge. Or actually pretty much in the middle of the river. But anyway, I got mixed feelings on this story. Ultimately, that company can't make you do anything. Yes, you might be out of a job for insubordination or whatever, but there are rules for the company. There are also rules for the driver. You are the driver. Even though somebody else is paying you to do this stuff, you're making choices and decisions. So if you had gotten that fine, it would have been on you because you knew of the issues and you decided to get in that truck anyway and drive it even with all the safety issues and mechanical issues and all that. The fuel's tax sticker. And I am no angel by any stretch. When I first got out of the service, it was kind of tough for me to find work and I really didn't want to go back into construction. So I I made a deal with this guy. <laughs> he was a he was sort of a let's call him an entrepreneur of the Italian descent. And uh he ran restaurants, pubs, and he had a waste oil company. So what I started doing was, you know, I asked him if he was looking for anybody, any kind of help. I needed employment. And uh, he asked if I knew how to drive a truck. And he pointed to an old GMC General tractor sitting in the yard. And even then it was a little getting a little old. And uh, I said, no, but if you have one of your guys walk me through it for a couple minutes and leave me alone in the yard with it for, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, I'll figure it out. I didn't expect him to say yes. And he said, sure. So we had one of the guys come over and show me what to do. Uh, and then he got me, the same guy got me into an international cab over uh, heating oil truck, which was converted with a PTO to suck oil out of drums and tanks and things like that and put into the truck and deliver it back to the yard. So I learned how to drive both trucks that day. Uh, what they didn't teach me was that even with baffles in the tank, hauling a 55 or 6,500 gallon tank, full of oil, the thicker, the better for me. But, uh, if there was any water in the truck, even with baffles, you know, stopping and starting quickly too quickly is going to make that liquid push you right through traffic lights. That was a fun lesson. Anyway, this was in the days just before CDL commercial driver's license officially took effect kind of nationwide. Before that, it was called an articulated license, which went by the state. You still had to have endorsements for, you know, air brakes, hazmat, and things like that. Did I mention that I never had any of those? <laughs> so I got this job basically just telling the guy that I'd figure out how to drive his equipment. And then he'd, you know, hand me an atlas and some, some fold out maps and point and tell me to go. And uh, I did it. I did it for a couple years uh, off and on. And then one day in the middle of winter, I was driving into Staten Island and uh, it was a little icy on the downhill side of the bridge. And like I said, liquid, when you go to slow down, if you're not careful, will push you quite a ways because of the momentum. And uh, I slid partway down the bridge. I recovered it fine, didn't hit anything, didn't injure anybody, but weights and measures was sitting on the other side of the bridge. And uh, yeah, so I got pulled by weights and measures. Then DOT showed up. And, uh, as soon as they asked for my manifest, you know, I had a manifest, but I don't think it was right because I think they were doctoring them. Uh, there was all kinds of sketchy stuff going on. Now they worked a deal with me where I didn't get, I got no trouble. I didn't lose my license, nothing, my regular car license. Cause I didn't have a truck license. Remember the bottom line is they could have fined the crap out of me because I made the decision to get in that truck. I knew that I needed these licenses, permits, and endorsements. I'm not, I'm not stupid in that way. Like I'm not illiterate. Uh, I made a conscious choice that I needed work and I didn't have the means or the time or the money to get the endorsements at this time. I was hoping that maybe once I got the job, they'd let me use their, their trucks and resources to get my licenses and permits and things like that. They had a couple other small trucks that I could have got my regular CDL endorsement and then gone for, you know, air brake and tanker and things like that. So, uh, you know, they didn't because my boss was a target already for all kinds of investigations from some of his oil was going places it shouldn't have went. Not that I ever dumped it there. Some of the contaminated soils didn't exactly go the proper places. Um, taxes were an issue for this guy. So there's all kinds of, you know, issues going on with this guy. Everybody and their grandmother wanted a piece of this guy all the way up to the EPA, from the EPA to some other acronym organization from the government. So they made a deal with me. I got zero fines. I just had to get away home, 
The truck wasn't going with me. I wasn't going with the truck, whatever. But by all rights, they could have, and I would have just had to eat it. I would have had no reason to be upset or angry because I made that choice as a driver. Now, should he also get in trouble? Sure. I mean, besides all the other nefarious things that he was doing, but, or should I say things he was allegedly doing? I had pretty much no knowledge of anything that was going on in that company other than what my job was at that time. And if I'd have thought anything I was doing was highly illegal other than my driving practices, uh, I probably wouldn't have stayed anyway. That's the long-winded version. But anyway, the bottom line is OP made some choices of his own that weren't great. And by all rights, he could have and should have probably gotten fined too. Again, if my boss here asks me to do something unsafe and I do it, that sort of makes me culpable too if somebody gets injured or property gets damaged or whatever. So, you know, don't think just because your boss said so that you're not going to get in hot water too. The boss wants meat? Okay. We had a workplace potluck. I'm vegetarian, so I make a lot of dishes without meat by simply substituting meat with seasoned tofu. My boss, despite knowing this, explicitly told me that it had to have meat. No problem, boss. I made tofu curry and sprinkled some fried grasshoppers in it. It's a health food fad. I brought it to the potluck and told everyone that it had grasshopper meat in it. I still got to have the free alcoholic drinks my boss brought, though. Well, the boss did say meat. <laughs> and I guess grasshopper technically counts. I'm honestly not sure what's worse in a dish grasshopper or tofu now i'm not a i'm not a total snob there are some tofu things that i like now i don't mind getting a block of tofu i know what it is i know what it's made from i can see it it's not disguising itself as turkey or some kind of you know ultimate meatless meat kind of crap burgers you know things like that so anyway um I don't mind taking tofu, adding a little flavor to it, and, you know, I can I can hit it in a, a cast iron pan and, you know, give it a little bit of a flavor and a crispness and a caramelization and make it taste good. I've used it in Japanese-style soups and stuff before, and it turns out really good. But again, I'm not pretending that it's meat. It's not pretending that it's meat. Tofu is tofu is tofu. So if I want tofu in something, then I know what it is. All these people drive me nuts, you know, making things out of soybean tofu and trying to, you know, play it off like, oh, that's a Thanksgiving turkey. No, it's not. It's a nope. block of tofu. I'm trying to think. We did. We used to make a miso soup and something else with tofu and, you know, spring vegetables and things like that. They were they were good. I had no problem with them. Just, just don't try to, you know, cover it up and tell me it's chicken. Only tried grasshopper a couple times. Um, the one time wasn't bad. I like them when they're super crunchy and everything just kind of crunches together. Like, uh, I don't know when I eat Chex Mix, how's that, you know, with the little bagel slices, bagel chips and things like that all mixed in. Yeah. There are different textures, but everything's crunchy enough that it, you know, there's no textural problem with the grasshoppers. The taste was fine, but the one, the one person had them pan fried, I guess they turned out great. Another person said they were pan fried or seared or whatever, and they were like half mushy, half crispy. And when I can start identifying parts while I'm chewing it, yeah, the grasshopper meal's over at that point. Mm -hmm. Treat the fire drill as if it were real. My great uncle passed away at 97, and I heard this great story of malicious compliance at his memorial service today. Oh, sorry for your loss, OP. He worked for over 50 years at the same confectionery factory, and for most of that time, he was a boiler room attendant. This was just after World War II, and at the time, most of the machines and processes were powered by steam, even the heating. The steam was generated by massive boilers, and it was his job to monitor the boilers to make sure nothing went wrong. These boilers could potentially explode, causing great damage. By law, the boiler had to be attended at all times, and there were shifts that watched them around the clock even when the factory was closed. They took so long to heat up that it was easier and cheaper to leave them running at night. After about 10 years of no incidents, the company hired a leading hand who would also act as the safety officer. He had been a sergeant in the army and he took his job quite seriously, being quite the disciplinarian. He instituted a multitude of new procedures, some warranted, some just to establish control. 
The first time he wanted to conduct a fire drill, he went around telling the staff that when they heard the alarm, they had to exit the building in an orderly, order, orderly, damn it. He went around telling the staff that when they heard the alarm, they had to exit the building in an orderly fashion. He got to the boiler room and it was my great uncle on duty that day. He informed him he would not be able to evacuate with everyone else and had to stay with the boiler. The safety officer didn't give him time to explain why. He just bluntly informed him that he was to treat the fire drill as if it was a real fire, no exceptions. When the fire bell finally rang, my uncle did exactly what he was told to do. He turned off the gas to the boilers, vented all the built up steam, purged the water and joined everyone outside. At the evacuation point where they were doing a head count when the production manager spotted my uncle and immediately approached him and asked what he was doing away from the boiler. He said he was participating in the fire drill as instructed, but not to worry as he had shut the boiler down completely. The color immediately drained from the manager's face. He was asked how long it would take to bring the boilers back online. Apparently it would take hours alone just to fill the boilers with water and heat them up. The big issue was that because they had done an emergency purge, they were required to inspect every pipe joint and connection for damage before to make sure it was safe to start to reheat. The other boiler men were called in and they got paid double time to work through the night to get the boiler ready for the next day. Production staff all got sent home but still got paid for the day as it wasn't their fault the factory couldn't run. It cost them a day's production as well. Safety officer did keep his job but for the next 40 years the boiler staff were all exempt from fire drills. You know, most of the time, when, when the old guy that's been doing this for a long time, working with dangerous equipment, and I consider, I would consider big steam boilers to be one of the most dangerous pieces of equipment there ever was. I'm not saying they can't be run safely and things like that, but you know, stuff happens. Um, <laughs> you know, look at some of the old locomotives, the old steam locomotives, and some of the big blowups they had when something went wrong, uh, either human error or mechanical failure, things like that. I don't know, man. They, they freak me out a little bit. Just the thought of all that pressure and, you know, the 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 metal, the, the cast metal or steel or whatever that the iron that encompasses it. Um, I mean, it's basically like a giant fragmentation grenade at that point. But anyway, uh, when the when the guy that's been doing this for a while and he knows what he's doing, tells you he really can't be part of the fire drill because of X, Y and Z and you cut him off. Don't let him finish explaining and tell him you have to treat this fire drill like it's real. That's what he's going to do. He's going to do an emergency shutdown procedure. And uh, yeah, I'm wondering how dangerous. I guess that's why they have to check the pipes. I guess the emergency shutdown. I think if you ramp up the pressure too much too fast, you would probably get stress fractures. I guess by letting it off super fast, all the, you know, the emergency blow off of the steam. Uh, does it cause, you know, instead of massive, you know, sudden expansion, does it do like sudden contraction? In the metal parts and fittings and things like that. I don't know. Something's got to happen because all of a sudden, you know, things that were pressurized are now all of a sudden not pressurized. And then there's temperatures involved. So it's just an older example of middle management, you know, muddling and things again, you know. NOP, sorry for your loss. But you know, 97 years old, he had a good run. That's awesome. Contractors keep calling my phone because someone else gave them my number. So for the past year, I've been getting calls from contractors asking if I want any work done on my property. They start off by calling me by name, which isn't mine, and then asking if I live at a certain address, which also isn't mine. I tell them I'm not that person. Please stop calling my phone. I tell them I don't own any property, so please stop calling my phone. I ask them to put me on the do not call list. Sometimes they just hang up. Sometimes they just get rude and say things like, why would we stop calling? You gave us your number. For a long time, I would just hang up before saying anything because when the call connects, it makes this beeping sound when I pick up. So I know it's them before they even say anything. Well, after over a year of this, I decided to say, yup, that's me, when they ask if I'm that person. When they ask me if I still stay at that address, I say, yup, that's my house. When they ask me if I want any solar, landscaping, painting, or driveway work, etc., I say, yeah, I sure do. Then they tell me they'll have someone come out to my property and what time is good for me. I tell them a time when traffic is worse, like late afternoon. Then they call me when they get there and tell me they've been waiting for 10 minutes. And I tell them I had to go to the store real quick and I'll be back in 10 minutes. It's very satisfying. I did that a couple times. Not to, I don't, I don't even know how my number got out there, but it doesn't matter. I mean, even before the digital age, your information got sold to so many people. If you got any kind of subscription, like my mom had a subscription to TV Guide once, which was weird because, you know, she grocery shopped the same day of the week every day for like 30 some years and the tv guy was right there at checkout and she 
She could have just picked it up, which she ended up doing in the long run. But anyway, you know, when I started getting weird, funky phone calls like that unsolicited, I would basically just, you know, tell them that I didn't order it, stop sending me stuff, stop calling me, and they'd still keep mailing me things. So I didn't really argue too much on the phone because a lot of things were still done through mail at that point. So if a magazine publisher, you know, would send me certain samples and things like that, fill up my box with junk things, I would use those little postcards, you know, the free postage paid postcards that you would get. And I would collect up junk mail from other companies package it all together, use that card and ship my junk mail to these people. And, uh, I would redact my name off of it. Uh, all except for the prepaid postcard, except that didn't actually have my name on it. It had their name on it. So yeah, any, any labels that were on magazines and things like that, that had my actual name and address on them that I didn't order, I would just package those up in a soft envelope and send them back and, you know, let them deal with it. I'm not sure if it ever actually pissed them off or not. They probably just, you know, took a peek in it in the mail room and threw it away and didn't think twice about it. But I like to think that somebody got pissed off somewhere and would get really aggravated when that stuff would show up. So that's the way it goes in my little fantasy world anyway. You know, one company that will never, ever cold call you? Me, Uncle John's Soap. So if you like handmade soaps, beard products, shave products, yes, I know I have a long beard. Why do I make shave stuff? What do I know about shaving? Blah, blah, blah. People ask me this kind of stuff like I've never shaved in my life before. I was in the military. I did shave for a while. And every so often I like to shave my head because I'm half bald anyway. Why not go for it when the weather's hot and I can enjoy it? Back on topic. Anyway, we're with the move getting ready to come up and things like that. Uh, like I explained in yesterday's video, it's it, things are going to get complicated real fast as we get into December. So if you're thinking about ordering something for Christmas, now is the time. Up from now until December 10th, I can almost guarantee buy Christmas delivery. Uh, you know, stuff happens. I don't run the post office, so I can't totally guarantee it, but I will do the best I can if you order by December 10th. Now, the website won't be shutting down completely, but production will shut down for about a week and a half, two weeks while we get things set up at the new property, as long as things go well. So... If you want to buy stuff, you can keep buying it. Just know that after December 10th, it's going to take a little longer to get out to you. And from now until December 20th, 20th? Yeah, December 20th, we are putting everything on sale, 15% off. Use coupon code ho 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 15 That'll give you 15% off across the board, no matter what you order. And of course, the old standard, if you, uh, if you order $125 or more in product, which is easier to do than you think, uh, we have some customers that like to order bulk things. So, you know, that adds up quick. We'll give you free shipping anywhere in the continental U.S. I'd like to expand it further, but uh, unfortunately, free shipping to Europe would um, pretty much bankrupt me. At this. So again, this is the website right here and the coupon codes right below it. UncleJohnSoap.com. Ho, 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 15. We'll get you 15% off. And we thank you guys for your patience and support through YouTube and through our website. And until the next video, guys, we'll see you.